in that direction? To flying? I've always been interested in aviation uh, since I was a little kid. Flying models. I'm long retired from flying, but I still fly radio control models. Mm -hmm. Now, you said um, earlier that you were taking some flying lessons prior to enlisting? Yes, I took several lessons. When I was 16 uh, in Connecticut, at that time, you could get your driver's license on your 16th birthday. I got my driver's license and went straight to Old Manic and took my first official flying lesson in high school. I was in high school then, actually. So it's the 1950s and you're living in Connecticut and you're a teenager. Yeah. You're getting ready to graduate high school. So tell me a little bit about that point in your life, um, how school was going, relationships, family. Uh, well, we had a very close family. Uh, I had uh, my, my mother's brother, my uncle Bob, was killed in the Air Force in World War II. But um, we, I, I went to school, high school, no, no problems. I never had any problems in school, and I uh, always enjoyed school. Um, so I just figured I wanted to pursue a, a career. And since at that time everyone had to enter the military at one point in their life, I figured I might as well go for where I'll get an education for something that I really want to do for the rest of my life. Um, I never looked to be a hero or anything. I just wanted an education. So at this point in time, you were living in Eastern Connecticut? I was living in Goodyear. I was born in Goodyear, and uh, I grew up until I would come out of the service as living in Goodyear, Connecticut. All right. So the, the, the conflict you took part in was the Korean conflict. Korean conflict. That, All right. Now, was it going on before you decided to enlist? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not that. Well, see, that was going on the, the uh, yeah, several years. It, 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 the United States entered the... Uh, the conflict in July of 1950, 1950. and so that, I was a couple of years before I went in. I didn't go in until 53, actually. It was, I went in in, in the spring, and it, and it was, a truce was called in, in the fall. Now, um, does that have any effect on your mind about, do you think you're going to have to see service? Um, Not really. I, I was a kid, and, and kids, you don't think of that. You know, I'm thinking of the wild blue. That's really, but I knew there was a lot involved, you know. All right, so the date is April 8th, 1953. What are you doing? Well, I'm getting ready to, uh, wait. I was waiting for the recruiter to pick me up and bring me to the train station <laughs> to leave for, uh, I had already passed my tests uh, in, at Norwich. Uh, post office. You're familiar with Norwich. Uh, what kind of tests were those? Uh, you know, your IQ tests and your, uh, not, no physical though. There was no physical there. It was mostly just testing your knowledge and what you'd be suited for because they like to categorize you. And so uh, went there for testing and then let, that was before I that was be, that was before I, that the day I that I they called me. I went up and it, they got on a train for New Haven. And there you pass the physical. If you were good there, you got on another train and was shipped to Geneva, New York, to Sampson Air Force Base, which was their one of two primary basic training facilities. Throughout this experience, did you have any? Uh, did you have anyone enlist with you, or were you just? Well, that, uh, it's, uh, it's it's funny that you ask that. Uh, you probably don't know uh, Richard Regis uh, from Dance, and we were kind of chummed around in high school. And he now owns half of Brooklyn. <laughs> he's he's uh, did really well, uh, but he got washed out on a physical, uh, so I was by myself. <laughs> I go on, you know, he was the guy I even listed with. But up we went on the train, and I'm going to tell you, that's, those trains were like built out of wood, and not, not like you 
go to Florida on. <laughs> and uh, it was a long ride. But we got there. And so what's going through your mind as you're heading down? Well, I'm wondering, is this going to be tough or what? Because at that point, it's all physical. I mean, it's basic training is basic training, whether you're, no matter what branch of the service, you, you learn all the same things. It's, it's mainly discipline and toughen you up. You know, you, you're forced to do things in any basic training, but it's good for you, you know, it gives you discipline. You, you have to, a lot of kids today could use that discipline, you know. A lot of them today don't even, I shouldn't be tough saying that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent. But yes, and it was good training, and uh, I can't say that I enjoyed it all because it was cold, damp, rainy, and you were outside in all kinds of weather. So you get off the train, how are you greeted? Was it right down to business, right off the bat? Or? Well, we were still dressed in civilian clothes, and we, they showed us up quarters, barracks. They, they issued us up clothing, you know, showed us to the barracks, and you had, <laughs> so we put everything away, you know, we're still in civilian clothes, and part of the training is to respond instantly to the command of the guy in charge of you, you know, your, your airman in command, so the first thing they start out with fall out, and when they say fall out, everybody falls out. Well, you gotta be dressed. Some of us were half dressed, because <laughs> now we go. And you, you had to, they timed the, this, they had to time, they would time the, how long it would take everybody to empty out the barracks. And there's this guy from Tennessee that wore high cuts, and he thought he had to lace up everyone, and every time he'd do that, and we were always last, of all the barracks, because this fella was putting on his high cuts. Uh, I remember that kind of stuck out in my mind. And other than that, really, you, once you start your training, that's all you're thinking about. So um, there's guys from all around the country at this base. Yes. And um, did you notice any differences between uh, being from Connecticut and people from anywhere else in the country? Well. They, see, Texas, Lackland Air Force Base was another training center, but they, they took mostly the west and deep south, and mostly the people from at uh, Geneva were from New York, uh, mostly the northeast and, you know, like Chicago, all, all over that area, yeah. Yeah, there was, there was a good mix of people. Um, so what's one of the uh, memories that sticks out the most in your mind about basic training? Leaving. <laughs> uh, yeah, like I say, it was it was a, the bump time of year for that, you know, for that area. So you had weapons training. You uh, used what M1 M1 Garand? Uh, M M16. It was the old military rifle that everybody used. Mm -hmm. That's what we used for training. I I think it really was uh, when we did marksmanship. It was a 22. It was set up with a 22 in the same rifle. I don't know how they did it, and because you know the waste of bullets, and, and uh, but we didn't have too much of that training. Uh, how was the food? In basic, well, the food was was pretty good. Uh, you had to. Uh, Wash your own tray on the way out, and you really got to, everybody scrubbed them because you can get uh, terrible trots from a, an unclean tray, you know, with the grease building up and stuff on it, and uh, everybody was afraid of getting that, so you cleaned up your own tray and mess, and you couldn't leave much, you know, they had big garbage cans, can't fight, so you couldn't throw away half your food. You took what you needed, and that's all. Basic training, and then you're a private. You know? after, after, yeah, you're well, you're uh, no, you're a basic uh, airman, uh, which is 
uh, no stripes or do you get one stripe? I guess you get one stripe after you get out of there. Um, yeah, from, from there, then I found out that I was going to Lackland for Air Force Cadet Program. And of course, this was in uh, 53, so there was no Air Force Academy yet. The Air Force Academy opened near, uh, in Cold Springs, Colorado, near Denver in 1955. So I would have been just graduating about that time had I went, completed the program. Apparently, I passed the, all the aptitude tests for flying. And uh, so, went down there and started the training. And that was getting to be summertime. And that's the first time I went to Texas. And that was, uh, that was you, very strict discipline. At the, at the cadet, you know, the officer's training academy. Oh, very strict. But there again, you know, you put up with it. So what were, what was, um, what were you doing when you were at Lackland? Well, the cadet program, you know, part of the time you were tr being trained to be a United States officer. You know, you, like I was telling you, the square meals and square parade routes if you had got so many demerits, which was pretty easy to get a demerit. And then the rest of the time was classroom, you know. Um, all, you know, algebra or just regular classroom for all the information you need to become, at that point, uh, a navigator and a, on a B-52. So that's what they wanted you to be, was a navigator? Well, that's, that's all, see, they, they kind of put you where they had an openings, the openings, and so that's what I found out. So that's where I ended up, there. And, uh, but then, as I explained in the, in the notes, that uh, I had gotten married, and the rule was for cadets, so you could not be married. But at the time I got married, I did not realize that I was qualified for the cadet program. So I says, uh-oh, now, poor decision. I says, I'll just keep my mouth shut, you know, and they won't know I'm married, and they don't need to know. I figured wrong. Uh, so somehow they they found out I was married, and uh, I was eliminated from the program. But they recommended me for OCS, which is uh, married men. You can be married and attend OCS, which was but I the rib was the rip was I had to sign up for four more years, an additional four years which that would have given me eight years. And being young and foolish, I said, no, wouldn't do it. So next best choice, I'm off to meteorology <laughs> training in uh, Chinook Field in, uh, in Illinois. Now, how did you feel when um, <clears throat> this meant this would mean you wouldn't be flying? If you're going to meteorology school. No, well, I, I, I was recommended for OCS. I could have gone any time I wanted to sign up additional four years. But I went to meteorology school, and it was very interesting, very interesting. And this was in what state, Illinois? Yeah, Illinois. Yeah. So which, how did you, did you like Texas or Illinois better? Actually, at, at that point, I think, uh, see, I'd only been to Texas in the summertime. I mean, and it was warm. <laughs> but by the time I got to weather school, then it was in the winter. And in the winter, it was cold. The barracks were old, World War II barracks. They were coal-fired furnaces. They were cold, period. And when you got up in the morning, you could see how, where you laid on your pillow because it was an only white spot. <laughs> Yeah, it's a wonder we could live through that. You know, they might, you wonder all those fumes must have came through the barracks. But we we made it. All right. So you're going to meteorology school, and was that your decision or the? Military? No, I. That was one of the fields I chose. Uh, second, what second other best. Options were available to you. Most anything. Um, 
but that's the one I chose. I, that was the closest to flying, and uh, I, I just really wanted to figure, well, if I'm not going to be flying, then I'll be close to it. The pilots come in for briefings and everything, you know, you're really close to it. All right, so meteorology school, um, what were some of the classes there? What was, what was that whole experience like? Well, you, uh, you just, they introduce you into the basic uh, meteorology program. You, le you learn the signs of the weather. You look, you look outside the window or outside the building and you see your different cloud layers, you know, your stratus, cumulus. Strato-Q, your Cirrus, cirro -Q. and each one of these, you knew when you saw that particular cloud about what the height of the cloud was, because they're low, middle, and high clouds in, in, that ca in each category. So we learned all the weather. We learned, bar you know, about barometric pressure and um, uh, why the wind turns as it does because of Coriolis force, you know, the turning of the earth. And uh, then we had to learn the weather transmission to other stations all over the world. And that's where we had to encode at that time. But this is all antique. This is scrapped years and years ago. But we would, you know, encode it. And then every hour we would get on a teletype and we'd punch it out. In, on the old, the old strips, you know, and on Q, then we would transmit it, and it would go all over the world. And then all the other weather observers all over the world would do the same thing we do. You, when it comes to our station, we had to decode their weather and plotted it, actually physically plotted all the stations, you know, as particularly in our area, uh, uh, whatever area we covered. And uh, we would plot it, you know, wind, temperature, pressure gradient, you know, the pressure's rising or falling, and uh, the clouds and any particular weather, if we had fog or if we had whatever it was. And then the forecasters would take that. That was the next grade meteorology up. And they would actually draw the fronts on, you know, like you see now on Scott and all of those guys, they, they draw the fronts on. And, uh, and the location, and then they predict like when the front would go by the next station, you know, and then they were pretty close to, closer than Scott. And other things, you know, we would learn how to uh, plot the upper winds. You know, we use such antiques as a theodolite and a given weighted balloon and timed it from, we let it go and then time it. And then every minute or so, you'd take a reading as to how, what the angle was, you know, the, uh, the horizontal angle you were located at, and then the vertical angle that it was up, so you could figure your winds by that, speed and direction. Uh, that was the forerunner to the uh, Raywinson, which was carried the transmitter up with it. Up, you know, uh, dragging under the balloon, and that would transmit winds and pressure and speed and direction, which was far cry over our pen <laughs> and pencil. But it, it, I'll tell you, it was an interesting. It's interesting, and it is today. I still enjoy re watching weather all the time. Yeah. So at this point in your life, you are how old? Nineteen. Yeah. Going on, yeah, 19. So, did, did you miss Connecticut at all? Were you homesick, miss your family? Well, you, pro probably for a, a short period of time, but you know, uh, in those days, uh, I keep saying those days like it's horse and buggy, but in those days, there was no cell phones. A lot of guys, folks never even had a telephone, and all we did was write letters and you wrote a letter, and you might get an answer in a, maybe a week or 10 days, because it wasn't that fast. And so you didn't, it wasn't like today, where you'd probably be calling your wife, girlfriend, mother, or whatever, 
every day if you wanted to, you know. It, you just didn't, that's not the way things worked. But the military kept you busy? Oh, yeah. Kept you <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. So you're, at, you're in Illinois, you're going through meteorology courses, you're having your lessons, um, you're working towards becoming a... At that point, it was a meteorological technician, which was what they called them, a weather observer. And that you were training in training for forecasting, which is another step. All right, so this was the entry level position? Yeah, this is kind of like the entry level, right? And they saved the forecasting school uh, for the fellows that's going to re-enlist after the four years. That's when they give you the big bonus, the other stripe that they wouldn't give me. And, you know, and you signed on for another four years or two years, however. Six months, maybe six months. All right. So, was there a ceremony? You graduated from there. Was there a graduation? Yeah, but it was nothing fancy because everybody, all they wanted to get home because then you got your first leave, you know. All right. Um, your first leave. Uh, you left Illinois, went back to Connecticut. Yeah. After a fashion, you got there. It's. <laughs> I think the first time I went home, I went home. I had to take the train from from Champaign, Illinois, which was right. We weren't too far from Illinois, uh, you know, the University of Illinois. That was handy. It didn't you, uh, but to take the train to Chicago, then to Chicago to Worcester. I mean, it was no easy trek. Uh, but I drove back. I I got it. I took my car back. But I, but I went home. You're going for two weeks. They don't want to make it easy, you know. So you have two weeks back at home. Mm. Uh, what did you do during these two weeks? Probably spent most of the time with my girlfriend at the time. Did, and um, did they tell you that you're going to be deployed after this? No, I already had my orders. I knew, I knew where I was going. I knew I was going to uh, Eglin Air Force Base in uh, Florida. An excellent time of year, too, because it was over the winter, you know. Well, and then into, I think I left for overseas in July, so it was quite a while. But Halen Air Force Base was a an interesting assignment. It really was. What was your, uh, what was your duty there? What were you doing? Basically the same thing. Weather observer, when you're in weather, it's basically the same everywhere you go. It's different people, and it's different weather, naturally. And there's a different base mission. Uh, this, Eglin was a testing facility, and I suspect it still is, uh, which put airplanes to its limits. And they had bombing ranges there. And one thing that I thought was interesting was, at the time anyway, it might not be now, it was uh, the largest hangar at that time in the world. It was huge. And they actually could manipulate the weather and create rain in inside and actually you couldn't fly airplanes inside but you could put many of them in there and then they could make it freezing and cold to see how they would react and start and so forth it was uh, it was very interesting so could you describe a, a typical day of yours for me down in florida well, it's almost like civilian life, actually. When you're in the Air Force, that's pretty much what it is. You get up in the morning, and of course, I was living on base with my wife and child. And uh, you'd have breakfast, and I'd carpool with a guy down the, not too far, live not too far, and we'd take my car, his car. You know, we worked uh, at uh, one of the one of the uh, airports on the base and uh, we'd work with the tower operators you, you work with that flight community you know the pilots would come in for briefings at, in at our base and then wherever they were going to we'd dig them out for them dig them the reports out uh, that was pretty much typical of day's work um, the working conditions were great it had to be air conditioned and, you know, you know, humidity taken out of the air, which 
was something. And uh, I can't say it was a, a difficult job. It really wasn't. Um, I really enjoyed it. All right. So after you leave this, you're going to Iceland. Uh, yeah. After, after I went back home and I spent well, the rest of the leave time I had there, which probably two or three weeks, I then I had I, I departed for Iceland. And you had a, a wife and a child. Yeah, yeah. They stayed with my folks. In Connecticut, so they stayed. With, and you went to Iceland. How did you get there? Uh, strange enough, <laughs> by boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went down to Fort Gilman, New Jersey, and then we left out of New York port there on uh, a troop ship. Uh, through the North Atlantic, North Atlantic, and the time of year where radar was there, but wasn't, you know, it's not like it is today. You know, and if you remember North Atlantic, that's where the Titanic went, <laughs> get hit by an iceberg. So we had, there was iceberg watch on the ship all the time, and when, oh, I'll never forget it, that that horn blowing all the time. I thought, ah, no, I'm glad I'm not in the Navy. <laughs> Took a couple, three days to get there. And we pulled into port. Uh, actually, let's see, we stopped, we stopped, we did stop on Newf Newfoundland, Goose, and uh, we did, never got off. I don't know why they stopped there. Uh, and uh, we, we were, you could see the port, see all the fishermen. But boy, to get in that, once you get to get in the port, it looked like it was a fort, you know, scary looking. But we only stayed there a couple hours and on our way. And uh, we got, of course, we didn't do anything on the ship because we weren't Navy and we were just being moved from point A to point B. When we arrived at Iceland, it was in the middle, pretty late in the day. And by the time we got on our I don't know if they picked us up with a bus or what, but I do remember that the Icelandic people were not that friendly uh, with the U.S. servicemen, none of them. N not us, not the Army. There was, there was three, Army, Navy, and uh, Air Force. And it was a civilian airport. We had half of it. But the, pe the people in town didn't seem to care too much for us. I think because they were more, more like socialistic type you know, I don't think they understood us. Um, we certainly didn't want to get too involved with them. Did they speak English? Yes, there. Yeah, every. That's one thing about the uh, Icelandic people. The English is the prime. They taught English, and then they also learn Icelandic, which is, I think, Danish. They, you know, that's that's where they came from. They're Scandinavian type people. Their primary. Uh, their prim primary uh, means of income was fishing. And they used to have fields of fish drying on a rack. And whoo hoo, took a little bit of getting used to downwind of that. Um, then by the time we get to the airport, it's about 11 o'clock at night, and we're going through athletic fields where guys are playing baseball and everything. Is daylight at midnight. And that's when I realized, oh, this is going to be different, you know, 24 hours of daylight in the summer and 24 hours of darkness in the winter. But actually it never got, in the summertime, it would, the sun would go down, but right along the horizon and back up. It never went down below. And same thing in the winter, it just was just plain dark. You, High noon, you drive drive the vehicle to lunch, and it's headlights and pitch black. Did that have any uh, effect on you? How long did you say it took you to get used to that? Well, we we had to uh, not very long because we worked twelve hours a shift. So, you know, we worked twelve hours, and then we'll go eat, go back to the barracks, sleep, get up, go to work really didn't make much difference whether it was dark or light. Uh, it was better when it was light, but what can you do? All right, so you're on the base. Um, 
Did you have friends that were with you through, uh, through from Florida or from any of your previous training? No, but I did meet people that I had met in previous training, not, not the base I was on, but there was a fellow from Worcester that I knew at Chinook. And he, we ended up there. And another guy from Downson sat in my seat in a chow hall, and I was going to throw him out because I says, hey, I had my jacket sitting on that uh, on the chair there. And I was saying, hey, uh, you know, uh, you sit in my seat. And he turns around and looks roughly, and I I know you. I says, I know you. <laughs> I said, what a shock. Yeah. Now, um, were there any confrontations between you and other uh officers and enlisted men in the Air Force? No, no, not really. Did we, we, we weren't pitched against it. You know, if you talk in the Army and in the Navy and the Air Force, we all got along. We're all in the same boat. You know, we're, we'd all rather be home. Now, uh, was there any branch that the uh, Air Force particularly poked fun at? Or? Well, you did, but not openly. You know, amongst Air Force guys, you did. <laughs> Well, you go out and do the same thing, but different weather. Uh, like it was it where at Keflavik in Iceland is where we were stationed is also a, uh, an international airport. So the civilians occupied half, and we had the other half with, between the three branches. So we did the same thing. A actually, the uh, civilian uh, Icelandic people that went to California to school sat right along. We worked all in the same office, uh, the weather office, and we were very friendly with them. They, uh, I can remember one fellow being real friendly, brought in some cookies his wife had made. And, I mean, I thought it was cookies, and, you know, it looked kind of like a cookie, and actually it turned out when he told me what it was after I'd taken a big bite of it, I couldn't wait to get rid of it. Dried sheep blood. Really? Yeah. That was a delicacy, I guess. And uh, how did it taste? I, it, I, I don't know. It seemed tasteless, but I just, just given the thought of what it was, I just mm, got rid of it. All right. Um, let's see. So, what were some of the differences in the Icelandic weather between the New England weather? Well, well, the. Um, Icelandic weather, you've often heard that Iceland and Greenland were misnamed, and it's probably true. I, mean, I know it's true because I was 12 months in Iceland. And in the summertime, I told you I, I had flown above the Arctic Circle to pick up the Army Band, and this was in, uh, <clears throat> this was probably summer, late summer, and it was 54 degrees above the Arctic Circle. And back at the base, you know, it, Iceland is located in the, the north end of the Gulf Stream, and the temperature of the water is warm, and consequently the air is warmer. The temperature, the mean temperature in February was 15 degrees warmer than it was in New England. It never really got cold, but it never really got warm. I think like a 53, 50, mid, if it reached mid-50s, that was a lot. But it was well above freezing. And we had, uh, there was a very, very windy because of the Gulf Stream, and difference in air temperature, and water temperature, et cetera. And it, the uh, interesting thing was you, you didn't get, uh, vertical rain, or vertical precipitation, it was all horizontal. It was so windy there that it, it, the rain went sideways. And it seems like without exception. And uh, when I saw very little snow there, I mean, it would snow, but <clears throat> never get up over a few inches. And you said uh, the Army band pick up over the Arctic Circle. Now, how did you get that assignment? My commanding officer, <laughs> he he uh, he had to fly so many hours. They had to fly four hours a month. They call them desk jockeys, and 
He says, you, he says hey, the, left seat, the right seat's empty. You want to go? So I said, sure. I took an, every opportunity I could to fly a Goonie Bird, a C-47. So I went with him. And that's when we went above the, you know, the Arctic Circle. But that was my ride I, over the Arctic Circle was kind of like unofficial. So I got a Blue Nose certificate, but not officially, because I wasn't on orders to go there. What was the Army band doing in the Arctic Circle? They, they, were, fly, they were stationed on, the, on our base, but they, they were playing up there, you know, for, at, at some Ocarary, which was a city above the Arctic Circle. All right. Um, the landscape and Iceland in general, um, how would you describe it? Very dull. The entire island, I should say, 95, 99% of the island is from is consists of volcanic ash. Nothing can grow on it. Anything they grow is in greenhouses. And of course, that's not a bad feature up there because they have hot springs everywhere. Everywhere uh, there's hot springs. You know, I match from the old volcan volcanic activity. And uh, so heating was no problem. I don't know what they did in the winter for lights, though, because really and truly, they were not light. And uh, in the greenhouse I'm talking about. Now, the whole city of uh, Reykjavik was uh, probably about the size of Providence, Rhode Island at the time. And the entire city, uh, private homes and shops and everything was heated with water pumped down or came that came down they piped it into the city from the hot springs above and uh, that's they had a good way to heat they didn't have to worry about oil now um, did you ever do any touring throughout Iceland did you ever have any free time to really go out and explore take in some sites well we we did from the base uh, we went around, but to see, as I was saying, they're not that friendly to the GIs. And we, we had a curfew at 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. And that's when they started their dances. <laughs> so apparently they didn't want us. We weren't welcome. So we'd hang around the base. They had plenty to, plenty to occupy it, yeah. What were some of the things that were available to you? Well, we had uh, the usual, you know, they had a base theater. They had uh, Officers Club, NCO Club, Airmen's Club. You know, they had good food there, and now and then someone would pop a beer or something. And uh, we really didn't have a whole hell of a lot of money, you know. <laughs> really didn't have a whole lot of money, because uh, we only got like about hell, half of mine went to the, my wife, so all I got was not much. <laughs> And uh, but see, everything was so reasonable priced in the in the, the base facilities. You know, they, they practically gave it to you, and and we had entertainers. You know, come down. And, uh, it was they make it interesting. So the Korean conflict is still going on at this point when you're in Iceland. Mm, yeah. Now, um, did you see newsreels or anything about that about the conflict? Um, what would what were your feelings about the conflict in your station in Iceland? Well, I really not. I really didn't think a whole heck of a lot about it. Uh, you're anxious because you know you have friends over there, and but see, news wasn't like it is today. You know, today I think it's too much, too fast. You know, we didn't know what went on over there. I mean, you know, when when did you get the news? Are you on a newsreel in the theater? How long does it take to get that? You know, it's already two weeks old before you see it. Um, so really, I never gave it a, too much of a thought. I know we had one one uh, guy from our one serviceman from our little village of 500. Uh, lose his life there. A friend of mine, I knew the family very well, still do. And uh, 
in all, I, from Connecticut, there was like 314 servicemen lost, lost their life during that three-year period. So when you're in Iceland, um, there are planes constantly coming in, uh, fighter jets, tanker jets, transports? Well, just about everything. A lot of civilian airplanes. Like I say, it was an international airport as well. Uh, any memorable experiences that come to mind about the airport itself? Anything uh, ever happened? Yes, I remember uh, we, that's the tankers uh, would tank up Operation High Flight, which the United States was flying jets over to Europe. And they would fly nonstop from uh, Greenland and to... Uh, probably Germany. And of course they couldn't do it without being refueled because uh, their gas burners, yeah, well, jet fuel burners. And, and they didn't want to take the time to, uh, to come down and refuel because you would lose, and it costs money to come down because you burn more fuel taken off again, so they'd send a tanker up and we never, it was always secret, I'm sure it's not anymore, but it was always kind of, everybody always wondered, how many, I wonder how many feed off that mother plane, you know, the mother fuel tank. Sure. And uh, one day, uh, tanker didn't quite make it off, and he crashed and burned at the end of the runway. And within a few minutes, here come five jets, five F-89s, whoop, 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 all landed. So then we knew. Five to a five to a tanker, but uh, it was interesting. Uh, the Air Force Base was the airport when just the airport. Uh, it was very large, and main we had two control towers: one near the weather station, and another weather station in a tower, which was about three miles from the main terminal and everything. And that was a uh, we had to do duty out there too. So, did you receive any uh, awards or citations while you were in Iceland? Well, I almost did. Uh, I passed the USAFI, uh, which is a correspondence course in in meteorology, in addition to the Air Force training. And this was an Air Force uh, training. That was it's a school, you know, for college. If you want to get credits and that, you go USAFI correspondence and so I was the base my commander of the air of my uh, station you know the weather station recommended me for airman of the month to the base commander and told him why and so I was going to be awarded this big honor with photographers the whole schmear so that day that I showed up for that they asked me to go out to the control tower out at the other end of the base. It's only 10 minutes. You'll be back in 20 minutes. So I put a tank of hydrogen on there for the weather balloons and brought it out there. And uh, coming back, I, an officer had r r ridden off the road. And he asked me if I could pull him out with the winch on the front of the truck. I didn't know how to operate the winch. Bad decision, I tried. And Pritney pulled his truck right over mine. Uh, needless to say, that was the end of the, <laughs> the award for the Airman of the Month. Because I was late when the time I got back to the weather station, everything, everybody had gone. Oh well, easy come, easy go. All right. So it's, uh, you have 12 months in Iceland. And then you finished that up and you came back to the States. Right. Um, take the boat back? No, no, we flew back on, on a DC-6. Now, were you excited? How did you feel when you had to leave Iceland? Well, it's been a year since I've seen anybody, and I think I talked to him once on the phone, and the rest was all letters. So you're e eager to get back? Yeah. And um, did you have a leave period when you got back to the States? Yeah, a couple of weeks, three weeks probably. Now, how was uh, your wife and your child at this point? How were they taking you being gone? Well, they miss me, yeah, I guess. I don't know how much the, my daughter did because when they're that young, they don't 
really, they just forget. But I guess not. They talked enough about me. Good, bad, or indifference. So you get back to the States. And what's your next step from there? Well, next step was to figure out how I'm going to get everybody down to Texas. So you're being sent to Texas? Yes, that was my, uh, that's where I was to finish my, t my four years. All right, so we're back in Connecticut. The year is? 55. 55. And you're going to drive from Connecticut to Texas. Yep, and a nice looking used Dodge station wagon, 53, which was a new car to me. Yep. So I understand that, uh, you left the actual day of the 55 flood. The day that it, the first rain drops, I was less than 10 minutes from home, headed down Route 44, going to Texas. It started to rain. And I stopped and I put canvas over anything I had on the top. And uh, on the outside, and when I did finally arise and rise in, arrive in Texas, uh, I called my folks to tell them I was, we got there, and they said, uh, listen, listen, on the, uh, listen, can you hear that explosions? And I could, and I said, what, what's the matter? What's going on? I, di I didn't understand what happened. She said, the day you left, that rain you ran into was the beginning of the 1955 flood, which did a lot of damage where we left on the, you know, the Quinnebog Valley, it, any, anywhere on the Quinnebog. Putnam was totally decimated. The, the whole face of Putnam was changed. Uh, dam after dam was wiped out, and all the small little towns had floods, and it ruined uh, a lot. A lot of damage was very bad. That was, yeah, so I missed that. Not a bad thing to miss. No, that. no, not really. So how was the drive? Probably about three days. They didn't have, you know, didn't have turnpikes or anything like that. Transportation was, eh. And there were a lot of stoplights because you took like a Route 6 or a Route 1 and that's what you had. And there was, when you got through the cities, there were stoplights everywhere. So it was tough to make time. You had to make time at night. So you arrived in Texas, and uh, what base were you at? Um, it was uh, Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo. All right, and um, what was the military going to have you do there? Uh, same assignment, uh, the weather bureau, uh, you know, the weather station. And, uh, but it was more like a job, uh, you know, you're, I'm back from overseas. It's an Air Force base, a training base, multi-engine training, and uh, it was duty was nice. You, it was a nine to, not nine to five, but you know you had a shift to work, and you, you lived. You know I lived down the base in base housing, and I would just travel on my scooter, power scooter, and motorcycle, and then scoot up to work, and then be back and. Yeah, but you did what you did. Uh, we the assignment there was basically uh, report, you know, giving the briefing pilots on weather. And another strange thing there was, uh, I was wondering. We would wonder. There's a lot. There was a lot of secrecy back then. I wouldn't say it's secrecy. They just wouldn't tell you what you're doing. You know, I mean, you suspected like. We, there was an operation there. They called it. Uh, it was well. It was run by General Mills, and I'm not sure what that meant. Uh, but it was like balloons into the stratosphere. It was much higher than we have. Much higher than aircraft could fly. Well, you know, and uh, never knew why. You didn't didn't question. You know, you just did what you did. And, Plot your works, and they'd come in and they'd handle their balloons, and uh, mostly at night. And then uh, you knew the people, you know, and they were nice guys, they were civilians. 
But it, it's an interesting thing to come, you know, uh, like 50 years later. I was looking at, uh, I was watching the History Channel or whatever, and they were talking about the UFOs and how a big part of the UFOs were these supposedly these weather balloons. And, and I could really believe that now because they'd be so high up, it would be dark on Earth, you know, on the ground, on the Earth. But when you got up into the stratosphere, you were still under the influence of the sun. And that's what you could probably see, uh, you know. They could see weird things happening. So that was uh, interesting. But in hindsight. So you joined uh, the flying club when you were uh, Yeah, when I was there, I got, see, you see the same uh, flight crews all the time, you know, different students, but the flight crews were the same, you know, the, the instructors. And uh, I got friendly, the guy from, uh, that was a second lieutenant from uh, Pennsylvania. And he got friendly, you know, because he knew I was flying. I would fly, you know, and I, I wanted to get my license. He says, well, we'll fix you up on the flying club. So I joined the, the Air Force Flying Club. And, uh, and then I, I went on to get my private license. And he was my instructor. And we, we, I knew him pretty well. He, he used to fly up to Worcester a lot and, uh, before he was in the Air Force. So, so studying, studying the weather all over America right now and in Iceland. So you're back in Texas for the second time. Uh, what's your impression of Texas? Loved it. I can't say, <clears throat> I can't say it was uh, the heat. Uh, it was very hot during the day, dry heat, uh, but I wouldn't say it's not hot just because it's low humidity. It was hot. 110 is hot. Uh, but at night it would cool right down, just get right down cool. You'd need a blanket. And when they say stars at night are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas, they certainly are. I can vouch for that. There's no dust in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is clear. There's no clouds, you know, it's dry. And you can see those stars, every one of them shining. I, I really didn't mind uh, Texas, except for occasionally. Uh, I witnessed uh, my first dust storm there, where you, if you looked out your window, it was like looking into that window right there, and it'd be broad daylight. It would, the air, the visibility would be reduced to zero, and you couldn't be outside. You couldn't breathe. So that I got involved. I witnessed uh, not just in a weather station, but I mean, uh, actually looking out my living room window, and a sandstorm. Uh, briefly, thank God, because that take the paint right off your car. And I witnessed uh, my first tornado there. Uh, it wasn't very, it was, it was not close. It wasn't in close proximity, but I could see it. It was like two miles away. And uh, I remember, I think from that very tornado, uh, one of the weather forecasters in my unit lived near there. And he had his uh, car, that new car that he brought from England. And it got pounded by uh, baseball size hail and I didn't see the windows all smashed he had them fixed but he was riding around with a lot of dents in his car shame but that happened so your four years in Texas you saw overall you'd say they, they went well for you and your family yes yes uh, did your wife enjoy Texas she missed home a lot more than I did um, one of the reasons why I didn't stay in to go on to uh, forecasting school. It wouldn't have taken much to, to convince me the Air Force life. My wife would not hear of it, never hear of it. So I didn't. So. Do you have any uh, regrets about not doing that now? I don't regret anything I did in life or didn't do. Uh, you make, 
that mistake in life with life, you got one chance. And there's a lot of them since then that I didn't do that I probably should have or didn't. But I don't regret anything. So your four years of service in Texas, um, the, they end. Uh, what's, what was the next step for you? After I got home? Uh, so you came back to Connecticut? Yeah. Well, first thing was, oh, well, I'm going to get a job. And I uh, applied at uh, Rogers Corporation, which was in the town that I lived in at that time. And uh, I was accepted and I into a management position. And I, uh, long story short, I worked there for 20 years and retired. During the 20 years, or shortly after I got my first paycheck from Rogers, I uh, bought my own aircraft, 600 bucks. Whew. Could buy them cheap then. Same airplane, 25,000 now. But it was cheap to run. It was a uh, Taylor craft, 65 horse, cruise right around 100. And uh, Use only four gallons an hour, and back then, believe it or not, uh, fuel was 25 cents a gallon, so it cost me a buck an hour. So I was building up my flight time. I built up my flight time on that. It took me about a couple of years, and I got enough. I went then. I went to North Central Airport in Rhode Island. And I decided I'd go on a GI Bill, and so I did. And then I got my commercial license, and. Uh, Flew some more, built up more time, and then uh, I uh, I got I went for and and got my uh, flight instructor's rating. So that may be a commercial flight instructor, which I did that part time while I was working at Rogers. And then Danielson Airport came available. And when I uh, my brother got out of the service, he says, "What do you say?" I says, "Okay." So we started to do so. For, flight service and then change it later to Downson Aviation. And then we had our own flight school, second largest in New England. And I did that until, yeah, until I was 62 and then I retired. All right, uh, we're going to take a break and have this for a few minutes. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Experience influence your your life. Well, I, I, you you've, like I say, you learn discipline and just through the normal channels of the military. But officer training really disciplines you, and it prepares you for responsibility. and And I always had uh, since then a job w w with responsibility, uh, more thinking than doing. And uh, I even, you know, after at Rogers, I was a superintendent and I ran the, a Mectron division, uh, which made pots for the first capsule to the moon. And uh, when I retired from there, my brother and I ran the airport for Danielson full time. And we, I did a lot of flying a lot of flying then, both instructing and charter, to flying around the countryside. Interesting job. You go to work in the morning, and you don't know where you're going to end up in the afternoon. Uh, that I enjoyed. I, I can honestly say I pretty much enjoyed what I did through, uh, throughout my career. Now, are you a part of any veterans' organizations? Do you still have any connections with people that you had served with? Any friends? No, not really. Uh, I actually, you know, a lot of them are not here anymore. Uh, most everywhere I go, I'm probably the oldest guy in the crowd. Uh, and I never, the nearest guy, the person I, uh, well, there was, yeah, one fellow from Danielson, but I never got. We never we lost touch, and the fellow from Worcester that I knew, 
We never got contact. I had one guy from Mississippi drove up and stopped by my house uh, probably two years after we were out. He was just traveling around. And other than that, I lost track. Uh, well, I see the fellow that I was going to enlist with, uh, Richard Regis, uh, now and then, because he lives in Brooklyn. But, and I see, like, uh, see a fellow from Brooklyn, uh, uh, Tony Grizziak, he, he and we both enlisted at the same time. I went to the Air Force uh, school and he went to the Navy school in Pennsylvania, in Pensacola, Florida. So we were in the same time. And now I see him, you know, because he's retired, and, uh, long retired from Mohawk, uh, was Mohawk Airlines and it's uh, US Air now. And uh, he tried desperately to get me to go to Boston, pass the flight, the uh, flight physical, and fly with uh, with then Mohawk Airlines, and you know, as a co-pilot, then eventually a pilot, and I didn't pass that up. Never. So naturally, he retires and gets a million dollar bonus, and <laughs> but. That's the way it happens. Now, is there anything in this interview that I haven't asked you or anything you'd like to add? Let's see, I'm trying to think. Probably no one that will ever see this knows who Terry Moore is. But she was an actress in Hollywood, and she was had gone on tour. I don't, I don't think it was with Bob Hope, but around that time. And she and the one of her companions that was traveling with the show uh, were on, I did not know, but were at Iceland. And uh, I was out midnight or so taking an observation and uh, all of a sudden, whop, I get smacked with a snowball. And I hear girls giggling and I turned around and it was Terry Moore. Did you uh, confront her about that? Not really. Don't forget, I was in Iceland. <laughs> Any year you saw looked good, <laughs> no matter what. All right, now in closing, I just wanted to ask you a, a question about how you feel about the current U.S. military relations around the world. Um, do you have any opinion on that? I do. It's very strong. We should, need, we should not be there. We should have never gone there. That is not who we were after. And I do not believe in entering into a conflict to be as the one I was in that nobody ever won. To me, if you're going to go to war, go to war and go to win. Don't go there to get shot, people mangled and shot at with never having an intention to get it finished. And I strong. I feel strongly about that. I support the troops that are over there. It's not their fault they're there. Uh, I, you can hear all this baloney that we were misled, the president was misled and all that. That's, I think that's, I'm not sure that's all true. And uh, personally, I always thought it was a grudge match because of, of Hussein and his dad. I'm probably wrong in thinking that, but that's what I believe. I don't think we should be there. Um, do you have any personal thoughts of a, a good outcome? Any way we could? What do we need to do in our current situation to embedder ourselves in that situation? That's a tough one. Uh, you almost hate to pull out, you know. But you, once you're there, now we're now we're stuck. But. Mark my word, there's never been peace in that region, and there's never going to be peace in that region from biblical times. And they are different people. We can't force our, our democracy and way of life on those people because they think what they're doing right, their Quran and their way of life is the way of life, the same way we feel that democracy and the economy and so forth that we have and uh, the way we run our country is good. For, it is good for us, but not for, not for everybody. 
I never was a big fan of Hussein, but we know when you see the, the you know, all the, you know, what he, uh, unhappiness he caused over there. But when you look at the first pictures I saw of Baghdad, uh, when we first went over there, I was surprised. That, that was a darn nice looking city. And now we've reduced it to rubble. It's just plain crap. And I lost a neighbor over there uh, in Iraq. His wife lives with, across the street from me with uh, three little kids. And he was in the green zone. He'd been, that was his third time moving to Far East. And boom, he was sitting, eating uh, lunch in a restaurant. and. Uh, him and a few other guys got blasted out. That's not the only reason. I mean, I, uh, I still don't believe we should be there. I, that's only one man's opinion. Well, it's a valuable opinion. And I'd like to personally thank you for coming down here and uh, contributing to this project. I, I truly appreciate it. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me.